Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Madera County in California, the sighting took place at the end of a road leading to a trailhead that leads into the back of Yosemite Park. Early in the morning before light, my friend and I decided to hike up a ridge and sit down where we could see a lot of area, hoping to see a deer we could bag. We parked in an area just below the ridge where, when the sun lightened up enough, we could easily hike up to the top in about 20 minutes. As it got light enough to see the top, we noticed someone already on the ridge wearing what seemed to be full black of all things. He had no light and no gun, and we wondered where he came from because we had been camped there for 11 days and no one had come by that whole time. We watched him dig around in some brush for at least 30 minutes pausing occasionally for long periods to just stare in different direction. We joked that it was probably a hunter from L.A. because anyone would be crazy enough to wear black during deer and bear season. Then he began to walk down the hill right for us. Now we never left the truck yet, and he would walk a little ways and then stop and look around just as if he was hunting, but with no rifle. He walked just like a human, so at this time there was no reason to think it was anything but a man. After a little while, it was getting light enough to see even better, and he was still walking straight for us. When he was about 50 yards away, we both at the same time realized we were not watching a man, but this was a Bigfoot. He walked like a man, but he was not a man. He had jet black, shiny fur with a reddish color around where his eyes were. At this moment, I was ready to run clear home in one leap. I had to see this thing up close, and he had not noticed us yet, so I tried to open the door of the truck real easy so he wouldn't notice. But that old Ford truck was anything but quiet, and he heard the latch release and took one good look before breaking into a run. I tried to bring the scope up to view him closer, but this guy could really move. And I could not get my eye into the scope before he got behind a tree and never came back out. It took all the nerve in my body to walk over to the tree, but he was not there. He flat disappeared. My friend was hollering the whole time not to shoot and thought I was crazy for trying to go find him or a track or something. It was between 5.30 a.m. to 6.45 a.m. The weather was clear and the sun was not quite shining directly on me. All I know is I have a different kind of respect for the backwoods now, and I give a lot of room between me and large objects. I was brought up in these woods camping and hunting every year, and only heard of such things. The man I was with was my father's best friend, and he told me later that day that was the fourth Bigfoot he had seen in that area, but would deny it to his grave for fear of ridicule. He has since passed away when he was hit unexpectedly by a semi-truck. He told me he was hunting with his son, watching him zigzag up a hill around noon, when a Bigfoot walked between him and his son. The whole time, the Bigfoot never took his eyes off his son. He felt that it did not intend any harm, so he did not get alarmed. The first time he said he was parked in the same place and he was in his camper again around noon reading a book when someone walked by and waved to him through the side window. He didn't hear anyone drive up, so he thought he would go outside and say hi. There was no one there. Then he realized the window was at least seven and a half feet above the ground and it could not have been a mere man. On to the next one. 
in Southern California in late March or April. A friend and I were working on a footbridge crossing over Medea Creek in the Santa Monica Mountain. We had left the work to get some more logs. As we returned to the site, we saw a figure standing between us and the footbridge. We had been working on not ten minutes before. We then realized that our truck was beyond the bridge on the other side. This animal stood between eight to nine feet tall and was about four to five feet wide. No sound was made by the creature, no scent on the wind coming from our back, but we both knew we were not welcome there at that time and place. The feeling was that of malice, anger, and intimidation. We both decided to take another way back to the truck, being that we were somewhat intelligent people. To this day, when I tell people about my run-in with the big guy, it still sends chills all over my body. Sometimes when I'm alone somewhere, I still look around to see if it's there. One thing that bothers me is how long it was watching before it decided to take a look at what we were doing. I know if I were placed in a similar setting as the one that evening, I feel I would sit down and talk to it in a calm and friendly voice and hope I don't offend it. On to the next one. On a return trip to Klamath Falls, Oregon, from sightseeing in the Redwoods, my ex-husband and I camped on the outskirts of the Klamath National Forest. This was north of Weed, between Goose Nest and Herd Peak Mountain in Siskiyou County. I was having a dream that I was being watched. My ex and I had thrown our mattress in the back of our truck, which sat about one and a half feet lower than the canopy windows. The dream I had frightened me because the face I was seeing was not human. I woke up in a sweat and happened to be facing the window in the canopy in time to see a large dark form moving away from the window toward the front of the truck and out of my view. I sat up and very cautiously peeked out of the canopy window to see this very large, dark, hairy figure moving quickly up the hill into the forest from the campground. It walked upright with the gait of a human. It moved through the trees, giving me an estimate of its height at about seven feet. I remember losing my scientific detachment at the time, and as the thing disappeared further up the hill, I shook my ex awake and threw a choked and somewhat hysterical description explained that I was very frightened. I couldn't calm down, and he decided it would be a good idea to leave. We quickly got out of the back of the truck and noticed a very dank and musky smell. This scared me even further, and we loaded our things and drove out of the camp. I wish I had been in a better frame of mind during the event. However, the memory of the face I had seen apparently in the half-awake state and still see in my mind was not conductive to rational thinking. It was vaguely humanoid, with large protruding brows. The eyes were dark and intense. The noise was a strange mixture of a gorilla and a human. The mouth was severe and somewhat turned down with fleshy lips. The facial hair was not on its nose, eyes, or mouth. The head was conical-shaped with a pronounced sagittal crest. Frankly, it scared the life out of me. I am a student of anthropology at Portland State University and have never, outside of my immediate family members, discussed this with my colleagues. I have always been fascinated with a legend, but perhaps I never believed them truly until that moment. My family is amused by my story, but thinks perhaps I just had a bad dream. Doubt it. I was the only one to observe the thing However, my ex-husband can verify my extreme fright and the weird smell. The incident occurred in the early hours of the morning at approximately 4.30 to 5 a.m. The campground was barely lit with the light of false dawn, enough to make out individual trees and other camping areas. The sighting occurred at a developed campground and around mile marker 54 
north and east of Weed, California. It was a dense pine forest with little to no low ground cover. The trees, although dense, were straight and consistently spaced. Our camp was approximately 50 yards south of the restrooms. There was no camp between ours and the facilities. On to the next one. In Humboldt County, children found footprints on the beach of the bank of the Trinity River across from Tish Tang Campground, south of Hoopa. Al Hodgson of Willow Creek arrived Monday and saw tracks a shade over 16 inches long and seven and a half inches wide. They were a half a dozen altogether, but some were hard to make out. The tracks looked authentic to Hodgson. Hodgson estimated the tracks were two weeks old at least. The best ones were at the edge of the water. They led up from the beach and upstream, ending on bedrock. Only one was good quality and showed a slight arch. There were no tracks of people except of those who had found the big track. Grass an inch high was growing in the track. Hodgson had to swim the river to get to the site. On to the next one. The story which I'm about to tell you actually happened when I was 27 years old. I first noticed the man as I was sitting on my tailgate at a truck stop, drinking a cup of coffee and looking over my map for a location in regard to my fall hunt up north. For whatever reason, across the parking lot, and standing on the other side of a four-lane road, a tall man wearing a Hawaiian-style shirt and blue jeans had caught my attention. Again, I can't explain why, but I felt like he was looking directly at me as my eyes lifted from the map to see him. As the traffic broke with the change of light, the man proceeded to walk across all four lanes, heading right towards me. His gaze was fixed on me the entire time he walked, and something inside of me said, he's coming to talk to you. That's all I can say. I looked back down at the map, trying not to pay attention to him or what I was thinking, when suddenly I looked up and he was but feet away from me, saying hello. This guy was about seven feet tall, and his skin was flawless. He had a piercing look to his eyes, and within the first minute or so, I realized he wasn't blinking. And I do mean not blinking at all. He said his name was Angel, and without so much as asking me, he sat on the tailgate next to me. I noticed almost immediately that the buttons on his shirt had been buttoned out of order. In other words, he had started on the wrong button, beginning on the bottom, and consequently at the top by his neck, the one side had no button fixed in the slit, if you can follow that. Now, mind you, I'm sitting on the tailgate with my map open, having said nothing to him about what I was doing, who I was, or what the map was in reference to. He then looked at me, directly in the eyes, saying, So, you're a hunter. I said to him, How did you know I was a hunter? He said to me, well, the pickup truck and the map of the Northwest Country pretty much clued me in. The very next thing he said to me was this. Do you believe in God? I responded, no. Then he said, well, you know, if there isn't a God, then it really doesn't matter, does it? But if there is, such a creator will certainly require that his grandest creation give an account to him of their actions. He stood up right in front of me and was towering over me. He extended his index finger on his right hand and placed it directly on the forest location which I was planning to hunt on the map. He then said to me the following, A forest like that can hide many things, some of which can change a man's mind in a hurry. Without as much as saying goodbye, he said to me, God is always there when you need him, and walked away. I sat there, somewhat stupefied, as this man walked away in a completely different direction than which he came, 
and disappeared behind a building. It was in October that I had made my way into the timber on the northwest side of Kluchman Rock, between it and the southernmost fork of the Clearwater River. I had three days' supplies and my rifle, which was loaded and on safety. It was on day two, late in the afternoon, when I had stopped to lean against a tree and take a breather. That I had apparently nodded off as I opened my eyes and thinking I was in a dream, crouched down in front of me with its face so close to me that I could smell its breath was an enormous Sasquatch. It had shocked me so much that I initially threw my head backward, slamming it against the tree I was resting against, after which my eyes were focused directly on the creature. This beast extended its hand toward me with the evilest grimace that I had ever seen, and I thought to myself that I was a goner for sure. His smell was horrific, and his head was as big as a large watermelon set end to end, being oblong in shape and very wide. Its breathing was steady and rhythmic as he started to open his mouth and show me his teeth. It was then that the prayer to St. Michael, the Archangel, started to roll out of my mouth. Dear St. Michael, our Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and the snares of the devil. May God rebuke him. We humbly pray, and do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell, Satan, and all evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the souls of men. When I opened my eyes, I was laying on the bed of my pickup truck with my backpack and my gun lying next to me. I started to feel the scratched metal bed of the truck with my hand and began to sit up. I was looking around and touching everything, not knowing what had transpired and thinking I was losing my mind. I grabbed my gun and it was unloaded and my pack was totally intact and sitting in the corner of the bed. As I sat there, in my mind's eye, which is the only way that I can describe it, appeared the face of the man from the truck stop many months earlier. But now he was glowing and radiant. He said to me, God is always there when you need him, and faded away. His words started ringing in my ears about how a forest like that can hide many things, and how some of them can change a man's mind in a hurry. Well, it changed my mind it did. As you can see, I have never again told anyone that I don't believe in God, and since the experience which I had that day, I have become a deacon in my church. On to the next one. By the time I made the long hike, it was dusk, and I planned to spend the night. I was about 500 feet from the entrance to our gold claim when I saw two bats shoot out of the audit and swerve up over me and down into the thick pines on the slope below. I have been aware of a bat occasionally being in the large area that had caved in long ago, leaving a high cavern in a side tunnel, so I wasn't surprised that it had found a mate, but for them to take flight before dark was not normal. Of real concern to me was that the bats must have been disturbed by something inside the mine. Quite often in the past, I had been in the audit and observed the resident bat hanging up there in the larger cavern, but I never played my light directly on it, and I looked on the creature as our watch bat. Now as I approached, within about 300 feet, my hand had reached down to unsnap the snap on my revolver's holster in anticipation of a trespasser. Bears are not normally disturbed by bears or other animals, and our claim is too remote for transient, so as unusual as it is these days, I suspected to maybe find a hiker seeking shelter or a recreational gold seeker trespassing purposely to find free gold. My nerves were on edge because this claim is quite remote, so playing my lamp around as I entered the audit, 
I turned quickly from left to right, looking first down at the place where we had concentrated our most recent effort and where my tools were. I had left them on a ledge where I worked during my last two-day visit. They were right where I had left them. I hadn't gone but 20 feet when I heard the thump of footsteps as whoever it was had scrambled from the side shaft and exited quickly, hitting the partial half of the ancient door that had once been used to protect the mine when we had equipment inside. That was when gold was both more plentiful and more valuable. I had turned and bolted toward the door, and I had made the distance in seconds, and without thinking, I shot through the entrance, not thinking of someone waiting around the side, but what I saw brought me up short. There, about sixty feet in front of me, was a huge, hairy Sasquatch. I knew immediately what it was, because there have been a couple of these big creatures in this area for years. My wife and I have both seen them several times, and we never have tried to block our ancient mine on it, because... The only thing these visitors ever take is food, or their favorite thing of value is any kind of old tarp, or their very favorite prize are gunny sacks. We surmise they may use them for their beds, which we don't have a clue to where they are located, but most likely in an old, well-hidden mine shaft of which these mountains are full of. As usual, with the few contacts we have had and our family members before us, the Sasquatch do not appear all that afraid of us as we never yell at them, that is, after our initial shout of surprise. I noticed on those few occasions th that the Sasquatch also lets out a grunt of surprise, so it's obvious they don't like sharing their mountains with us either. We, like so many of our fellow miners, accept these creatures sort of our companion in a remote world of loneliness and solitude that goes with mining. The stories of these mountain apes go back as far as there is any recorded history of mining or exploring these mysterious mountains. Back in the days of the Indian Wars, an entire army of Native Americans hid out in these mountains. So it's no wonder the Sasquatch can live here unbothered for the most part because there are millions of acres with no roads. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much. And until next time, bye!